Hello, everyone. Kia ora. Wonderful to have you join us on another Canterbury Tech online event. It's our monthly event for October 2021. Of course, we were really hoping we'd be back in person by now, but uh, we think restrictions under level two would have made it a pretty rubbish experience. So we're sticking with Zoom for the time being. Neil Hamilton, GM of Canterbury Tech, and I'll be co-hosting. I'm Andy Paulson. And uh, we'll also be joined by Brent Omer, who is the chair of Canterbury Tech. Now, while we're online, if anyone has any concerns about the conduct of others during this meeting, please note the name, privately message Brent or Neil, and we'll consider removing them from the meeting. Also note that the meeting is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel on the next, in the next couple of days. Now, we've got a couple of great speakers lined up for you tonight. We're talking about the subject of extreme engineering, and we're quite excited about it. We'll then field a couple of quick questions via chat after each speaker, but we'll keep it brief. We're going to close out the meeting using some breakout rooms at the very end of the meeting. And so you'll be able to choose which one of the named or themed rooms you wish to join. Bit of a change to the way we've done it in the last couple of meetings, but we think it might work a little bit better. Two of them, those breakout rooms will be named Q&A Antarctica New Zealand and Q&A Tate, as our speakers have agreed to stick around and field a few more questions while uh, we're online. There'll also be some other named rooms that should be self-explanatory, and you can hop around between them as you choose to, or exit the, the meeting completely if that's your preference. It's perfectly fine. So just before Matthew from Antarctica, New Zealand joins us, uh, Neil is going to do a very quick Canary Tech update. Take it away, Neil. Yeah, Maybe. for a screen share. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I've managed to screen share that. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us again. Um, yes, here we are in October. We're thinking we'll probably end up online again in November, but who knows? So I'll run through a very quick update on a few things. Oh, bit of lag there. Sorry. Warm welcome to our newest members. Not too many companies this month, but welcome to Voyage and a few new students. So welcome to you all if you're on this call. And Canterbury Tech Summit is still scheduled currently for the 27th of October. I think we'd all probably think that looks a little bit at risk and we have some decisions to make about whether we postpone it again or whether we're, we might actually uh, hold off that decision for a while. So just hang fire for the time being. It is still happening, is the party line, Wednesday 27th of October. Uh, tickets have sold out. We've got about 20 on the wait list at the moment. If you'd like to join that wait list, please do. And our sponsors, thanks to all of you. Without you, we wouldn't be doing it at all. And a few of our speakers, and there's obviously more information on the site. And a bunch of exhibitors as well. So promises to be a really great day whenever it ends up happening. <laughs> what else we got? Um, we gave this to push for the socials a couple of days ago. Uh, AWS are one of the cluster sponsors of Canterbury Tech. So we like to draw some attention to some AWS events. So this is something that you can go looking for. A free 12-week program on cloud stuff. It is for Maori and Pacifica, someone who's affected by COVID-19, etc. So please go looking for it if that might be you. And the podcast, another Andy and Neil effort. Uh, we put another new episode out, I think it was last week with Julie Ryan from Custom D. We have another one in the pipeline. Uh, another interview scheduled and an, an eighth to round out the series probably in a few weeks time. So there's also an accompanying uh, written case study on our website for all of these. So please go check them out. Some other upcoming events. I'm not going to read them all out. We know there's a bunch of the larger events 
uh, that are going to be held in person, all getting postponed to February now. February looks like being a pretty busy month on the events front. Um, the Aerospace Summit is is the big one in Christchurch, I suppose. Oh, I've got a real lag happening here. Okay, now, Liz, who I now need to find. There we go, there she is. Asking her to unmute herself. Can you hear uh, me? Yes. UC Business School joined us as another of our cluster sponsors recently. And Liz looks after executive education at the business school and she's going to say a few words about what they've got going on. Thanks very much, Neil. This is um, very last minute. And if anyone in the room or in the virtual room knows Michael Philpot, you know that he won't be impressed that I have not practiced, practiced, practiced this 60 second pitch. Um, just a very quick overview. UC Executive Education is a fairly new initiative for the University of Canterbury. Um, we have started running in the last few months some short courses and I've been very, very deliberate to pick subjects that are either not delivered locally or are particularly relevant to industry here in Canterbury. Um, I'll talk just very briefly now about the product management boot camp that we are running on the 1st and the 8th of November. It's a two day course. We've run it once before. It's attracted quite a bit of interest. What we tend to do with executive education is bring in experts from industry to deliver this education. It's not the, um, the academic theoretical stuff. It's the practical how to um, so that you go away with a toolkit that you can use literally straight away. So we have a couple of product management ninjas delivering um, our product management boot camp in November. I don't think there's anybody doing product management training in um, a, certainly in a tertiary um, or in any of the other training providers that you might know of locally. Product management boot camp, what would it give to you for your business? Well, if you've got people who've moved out of a development role or a marketing role into a product management role, Let's give them, um, let's accelerate their experience so that they can perform um, in their roles as if they've been doing them for maybe three to six months. So it really is giving them the skills to understand the questions that they need to be asking, the information they need to be providing to whom and in a timely way. Um, so we've had some great feedback from our previous participants. We've already got I think five or six people signed up for the next course. We only take 16 as a maximum. We haven't started marketing it yet. So if you're interested, then get in quick. Um, so some of the other courses that we have got in the pipeline and working on a very exciting women's residential leadership program to be launched in the first quarter of next year, probably for delivery early winter time. We have um, an agile procurement workshop coming up and some other things that I'm just kind of working our way at to try and develop our portfolio of courses. We can also deliver any of these subjects as bespoke programs in inside a business if you've got sufficient interest uh, among teams. I think that's probably my 60 seconds well and truly used. <laughs> well, it is, but... Thanks for joining us, Liz. There's Liz's contact details down the bottom. She's not exactly hiding on social media, so um, I'm sure you can find her if any of those courses are of interest and you'd like to know more. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Now I will stop sharing. Andy. Right, and I will unmute. Uh, okay, so New Zealand's permanent presence in Antarctica is Scott-based. It's 3,800 kilometers south of Christchurch. The original base was established in 1957 and Matthew Jordan is the project manager for the $344 million rebuild project currently underway. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you for joining us at Canterbury Tech. I'm guessing there are some challenges on a construction project where the mean daytime temperature doesn't get above freezing. Yeah, we have quite a few challenges and hopefully I can explain a couple of those through my presentation tonight. Take it away. 
Cool. Can um, can I the host just uh, enable screen sharing for me, please? Yep. Should be done. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Neil. Um, I'll just make one slight correction. I am a project manager at Antarctica New Zealand who is working on the Scott Base Redevelopment Project, but I'm not the overall project manager that's in charge for the, of the entire project. Um, but there are a few, few areas where I feed into it, so I'll cover a few of those in this evening's presentation. So what I'm going to cover, first of all, what is the Scott Base Redevelopment? Why are we going through this project? What's the end outcome, what are we hoping to achieve? And, and what's it gonna to contribute to the overall uh, New Zealand's Antarctic program? I'll cover a little bit about how it's gonna be built and some of the considerations that we need to think about when we're actually going through this process. So it's not quite as straightforward as building something in New Zealand, commissioning it and walking away. There's a lot of things that we need to consider throughout the whole process. And I'll give you a timeline that we're working towards, which will give you an idea of when the project will be complete. So some of you may be familiar with the geography of Antarctica, many may not be, but given that we're a Canterbury Tech event today, I think most people will be relatively familiar. But for those that aren't, Scott Base is located almost due south of Christchurch at a distance of about 3,800 kilometres. And it's situated on a little island that's slightly away from the continent called Ross Island. Although it's not an island at the moment, it is connected by uh, the McMurdo and the Ross Ice Shelves back to the continent. Antarctica, the coldest, driest, windiest and highest continent. You've probably heard that before in your, in your journeys, but these are some of the challenges that we're dealing with. We experienced 24 hours of daylight during the summer and 24 hours of darkness during the winter. So our first challenge is we want to try and do as much as we can down on site while we can see. So our construction period is essentially limited from around about October through to March. The average wind speed that we contend with down there is about 19.1 kilometres an hour, but we have experienced wind gusts that exceed 170 kilometres per hour. The lowest recorded temperature at Scott Base is minus 57, which was back in 1968. But about three months ago, the winter team got down to minus 54. So they were, they were pretty excited that they were getting quite close to the record, but didn't quite get there. It's also a very remote and unforgiving place. And the, the picture that you see there in the background is, is not atypical. It's mostly sunny down there, but we do experience days like this where it makes being outside really challenging. So why are we going through this project? What is it that we're hoping to achieve? The current Scott base, has a number of different levels which reduce operational efficiency. So if you were to walk from one side of the base to the other, you'll encounter about 11 sets of stairs, which makes things difficult if you need to pick something up and take it to the other end. It's also about a 300 metre walk. So if you forget something on the other end of the base, you've got a big walk to go back and pick up the item that you need. The services, largely under floor, and they're difficult to maintain. So I'm not the biggest guy. I don't have too much issue getting down under the floor, but it's, it's not a very pleasant place to be if you're looking at fixing services, plumbing, electrical, or doing routine maintenance. Some of our key equipment is old and is a remnant from some of the redevelopments that uh, we went through back in the 80s and 90s. So we're looking at uh, replacing some of that equipment. Fire safety, so fire is one of the big problems that we have down in Antarctica. Although it's really cold and it's a bit counterintuitive, it's very dry environment. So a lot of the, the wood that we have down there, it's extremely flammable and 
we don't really have anywhere to go in the event of an emergency. So fire safety is one thing that we're, we're really, really uh, hot on. Snow drifts also require management. So clearance from around external doors and off the roofs, which leaves us in the position where we've got a few interesting things to contend with. The new base, for example, we're looking at having emergency exits or fire exits that open internally, whereas most buildings in New Zealand will have them opening externally. What we don't want is someone to be in an emergency, to push a door and encounter a big snow pile there, um, removing their ability to exit the building. So the project objectives, we've got five objectives strategically that underpin just about everything we do. So we want to maintain a continuous presence in the Ross dependency. That's a presence that we've had going back to Sir Edmund Hillary's days in 1957. We want to protect the Antarctic environment and provide an environment that keeps people safe and healthy. We want the project to enable logistics and support really high quality science. And that's not only logistics getting people from New Zealand down to Antarctica, but also within the continent itself. So helicopter movements, fixed wing movements, or traverses out to areas of scientific interest. And we also want to maintain New Zealand's credibility among Antarctic treaty nations. So we are governed by an Antarctic treaty, which oversees operations throughout the continent. New Zealand's very highly regarded within this Antarctic treaty system and we want to maintain that reputation. This is the current Scott base. You can see it behind me as well. There are 11 interconnected buildings and a number of outbuildings. The building down there in the front, the yellow and the orange one is called the TAE hut or the Trans-Antarctic Expedition Hut. And that was the first building at Scott base. So back to Sir Edmund Hillary's days in 1957. That was one of the original buildings that they used for, for their endeavors. This has been preserved by the Antarctic Heritage Trust and is designated as a historic site and monument under that Antarctic treaty system. The future Scott base will be three interconnected buildings on the same site as the existing. We are working with a number of constraints one of those being the foreshore, this, uh, the sea, and the pressure ridging, and the kind of constrained natural environment that we've got there. Three buildings consist of accommodation in, and welfare in building A, a science and operation facility in building B, and engineering and stores within building C. To give you an idea of the floor plans and the architecture and the engineering and the thinking that's gone into these buildings, we've got these floor plans in building A, you can see accommodation through the, uh, the bedrooms, we've got a, a dining room sitting down there at number two, so this is your kind of hotel type function of the building. Building three starts getting into science support and operations with your office spaces and lab spaces. And in building C, this is where all the engineering and the heavy lifting happening happens. Lots of storage, cargo, workshops and the like. The buildings are also interconnected by these linkways that you can see. And the theory behind those is the upper level of the lower building connects to the lower level of the upper building. So it's essentially one large floor spread across two buildings. The construction and the logistics. So we've made the decision to build the new base in New Zealand near a port facility. We will then ship the new base to Antarctica in large modular sections on the back of a flat deck ship similar to what you can see here. Once the buildings arrive in Antarctica, they'll be placed on their foundations and the existing base will be deconstructed and returned to New Zealand. The buildings themselves will be transported onto the ship and off of the ship using these red trailers, they're called self-propelled modular trailers. 
And that gives the, the ability to climb gentle gradients, but to move the large building modules into place. The foundations will be pre-constructed, sent down and installed at Scott Base, and then the buildings will be dropped onto those once they're hauled off the ship. Here's a brief 12 point slide on the construction methodology and the logistics. So firstly, we'll establish a site near a port in New Zealand. The buildings will then be constructed at that port facility. We'll construct a haul road down at Scott Base for the buildings to be moved up into position. The Berthing area will be developed so that the ship has somewhere to moor. The modules in New Zealand will be broken down into modular sections that can fit on the back of the ship and we'll install end caps on those for weatherproofing for the journey through the Southern Ocean. The modules will be moved onto the back of the flat deck ship and they'll continue their journey from New Zealand down to Ross Island. The ship will then be offloaded with the buildings placed on the self-propelled modular trailers and landed onto their piled foundations. Once the modules are placed, they'll be connected together, then we'll install the link bridges and the remaining commissioning can occur in Antarctica. The benefits of this approach, this construction methodology will significantly reduce any health and safety risks of building in Antarctica. And it gives us the benefit of being able to construct the buildings year round under normal New Zealand conditions. The added benefit to that is if we forget a screw or a bolt or a nut, we can duck down to Bunnings or Mitre 10 and pick it up. It's a, a luxury that we don't quite have down in Antarctica. It will reduce the number of construction workers on site at Scott Base. It means less people to accommodate, less seats on planes, which essentially means more for science. It gives us the opportunity to fully commission the buildings prior to shipping so we can work out any areas that need fixing before we get down there and have to do it in a much more difficult environment. It also gives us the opportunity to test and train staff on the new base operations while the buildings are in New Zealand. As part of this process, we will be constructing a temporary base, which will allow Antarctic and New Zealand science program to continue with operations throughout construction. So minimizing the amount of impact that we have on BAU. It'll allow us to use as much of the existing base as possible to reduce costs, minimize health and safety risks, and limit the amount of infrastructure required. It will also allow us to accommodate the additional number of construction workers and science and operational staff while the project is underway. And will also give us the opportunity to continue summer and winter operations. As part of the project, there are a few areas that will be impacted for varying reasons. And some of those are science experiments that have been running for varying periods of time, but we refer to them as long-term science experiments. So for example, we have an anemometer or a wind speed monitor that checks wind speed and direction and the altered wind flow around the new buildings could potentially disrupt the data set that we have. So we've undertaken a process to build a new one in an area that will be unaffected by the new base. We also have a geomagnetic experiment, which measures fluctuations in Earth's magnetic field and the increase in the amount of steel in the new buildings will affect the measurements. So we're undertaking a process to shift that geomagnetic experiment to an area that won't be impacted. The critical aspect of that is that we overlap data sets to maintain that continuation of the data that we've had for, for long periods of time. We have 20 science experiments that we'll look to relocate. And I can go into a little bit more detail there in question time or breakout rooms if anyone's interested in that. As part of the project, we'll also be upgrading the wind farm or the Ross Island Wind Energy Network. 
We currently have three turbines that supply about a megawatt of power to both Scott Base and nearby McMurdo Station, which is operated by the US. They will reach the end of their intended design life in 2030. So we are making plans now to ensure that by the time the new base is operational, we are running off as much renewable energy as we can. The increase in size in the new base meant that we have ambitious goals to reach a higher renewable energy target. The three existing turbines will be replaced by four larger turbines, which will essentially take our output from about a megawatt to close to four megawatts. We'll also add solar panels to the sides of the three buildings, which will overall give us 90% renewable solutions to the new base. In terms of the project schedule, everything above that timeline, so the design and NZ construction and commissioning are New Zealand based works. Everything below that it are operations that are happening at Scott Base. So we'll have our first project shipment in the 22 23 season, so that's the, the summer period. We'll begin Scott Base demolition and earthworks from 2022 through to about 2025. The temporary base will be operational from the 23-24 season until the 26-27 season. The wind farm we're looking at replacing from the 23-24 season through to 25-26 with our first module shipment of the building sections in 25-26. We're aiming for project completion in 2028. So that's a summary. Hopefully it's given you a good idea of what we're planning on doing and how we're planning on completing the project. I'm happy to take any questions or answer any in the breakout session afterwards. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate that. Uh, we've had uh, no questions come through in the chat yet, I don't think. Neil, is that correct? Yeah, look, I think we'll just move along to Yoram actually and questions can be directed in the Q&A uh, Antarctica breakout room at the appropriate time in 20 minutes time or thereabouts. Perfect we've got one question that snuck in before we signed off on it though. Uh, Matthew what's the expected cost? So the government has announced in the most recent budget that they've allocated 344 million dollars for the project. And look, we here in Christchurch all know about um, project costs blowouts. What's it likely to actually cost, do you think? <laughs> We've got $344 million, so that's what <laughs> Good answer. Uh, nicely done. All right, thank you very much, Matthew. We'll see you in the uh, breakout sessions a little bit later on. Great, thanks, Andy. Now... We all know the name of Tate Communications here in Canterbury's uh, tech community. They are one of Christchurch's oldest tech companies and recently celebrated their 50th birthday. Uh, the company is a multinational radio communications provider to emergency services, law enforcement, and various other verticals in countries around the globe. Yoram Bennett is uh, interim CEO, and we're delighted to have him join us uh, here this evening. Welcome, Yoram. going to share my screen. Let me know. Yep, we can see your screen. Yeah, perfect. Good, good. So thanks, Neil. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Joran Benit and I'm the CEO at uh, Tate. I welcome the opportunity to speak to you all um, about, uh, about our company and where we are today and where we're going. A little bit about myself. And I'm an electrical engineer. Um, started my career with uh, Morola Solutions, a big, big corporation. Most of you probably know Morola. Uh, um, spent uh, 31 years uh, with Marola implementing systems around the world. I started in the Middle East, uh, spent uh, 
a couple of years in uh, Colombia, South America, uh, designing and implement, implementing a telecommunication uh, system in Colombia, nationwide uh, system back in the 90s. Uh, then implementing system in Chile, uh, nationwide system in Chile, in Brazil, in Peru, and in other countries, then uh, 20 years in the States, uh, in California, New York, and, and other states, uh, as, part of, as part of Morola, of course. In 2015, left Morola and joined uh, Harris Corporation, a big defense company, uh, billions of dollars uh, in revenue. And uh, part of their business is uh, telecommunications. So I, uh, I had the uh, product management uh, for the corporation and for three years, 2015 and 2018. Through those three years, I uh, got to know uh, Tate Communications because at that time, Harris Corporation and Tate had uh, signed uh, an agreement to go and resell uh, Tate product and Harris product in uh, North America and together in 2018 joined Tate a year after I uh, was appointed uh, chief operating officer and recently uh, uh, interim uh, CEO. So with that I'll go to uh, to the next slide. So before I get uh, Talking about, about Tate, I just wanted to thank Matthew Jordan for a very interesting presentation. Uh, Tate has a long association with New Zealand's Antarctic program, going back to the middle uh, last century. This picture, I think, is from the 1990s, uh, from a series of publicity shots we had done uh, for, a, for a marketing campaign. The ability of Tate equipment to keep performing in tough environments has been a strong part of the brand for many years and is uh, fundamental to our engineering. I'm not sure we can match Matthew in terms of extreme engineering, however. <laughs> Going to, uh, to our to quick introduction about uh, our, our uh, company. Um, a lot of people seem surprised that we, we continue to do as much as possible locally. Uh, we have everything under one roof, uh, manufacturing, um, development engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, um, and all the other corporate uh, shared services under one roof. And we're small and, and, and flexible, and we're very, very fast to, to the market. I can share with you from experience I have with other corporations, they're very, very slow to react to uh, market changes. We at Tate, react in a very, very uh, quick, quick way, and, and customer loves us for that. And our surface mount lines are capable of placing down to 0 to 0 1 com a component, componentry, meaning very, very, very small component, and the industry is moving in from, from uh, a big component to so a small component, so we had to purchase some uh, surface mount machines plus gear and, and put it in our factory. Um, so today those, those machines are able to place 100,000 small components in one hour. Overseas, we have offices in North and South America, in the UK and Europe, Middle East, uh, Singapore and, and Australia. Alongside sales and channel management, some of this some of these sites also offer precious engineering and support. Uh, our overseas staff number is around 150 people. So those are the market segments uh, we serve, uh, public, mainly public safety, utilities, transport, and extractive uh, industries. This picture was taken from the, the Brisbane buses. Uh, those buses are using our technology and narrowband technology to communicate not only with each other, but also with the call center. Our basic customers mix hasn't changed for a couple of decades. I say our customers are organization which have mobile uh, workforce, uh, which absolutely rely on their communications to keep serving their com uh, communities. So they are very, very conservative. 
they change only slowly and only when they are sure that any upgrade is going to be at the least as reliable as what they have uh, they had before. Um, you cannot, for example, you cannot use a metrop metropolitan police force serving a population of millions to better test an upgrade. Um, clearly a technology, the neuro neuroband technology that has been developed 20 years ago, it got to a point where uh, customers are expecting when they press the button in an emergency, in an arrest situation, they will be able to communicate. Take, for example, New Zealand police or St. John ambulance or, or the fire. They cannot rely on, on you know, Vodafone and Spark today because those systems are built for uh, consumers and not for, not for public safety. Uh, so we'll continue developing uh, and, 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 and enhancing those capabilities as we move forward. So customers are, those customers are reluctant for moving to a, a broadband technology rather than sticking to, uh, to the old and reliable one that they have today. So looking into you know, the past on uh, the future, so traditionally uh, Tate uh, from the network infrastructure side, we have uh, spent billions of dollars in narrow banding infrastructure. Won't get into the technology per se, but Project P25 and digital mobile radios are both uh, two uh, narrow band technologies that they, uh, the industry we are serving uh, and purchasing those equipment for the last 20 years, as, as I said, it's very, very reliable. On the devices side, we have portables and mobiles that go, uh, go into the car, into a fire truck, ambulance, police car, and access control uh, devices. Um, this is what Tate has been doing you know, for the last 20, 30 years. As we look, you know, in the last two years, uh, we have added push to talk over cellular. As there is more data hungry applications that police, uh, police officer needs and so forth, ambulance, we, were, we had to add uh, push to talk over cellular. So you see on the services, we added this uh, uh, functionality or, or uh, feature. And as narrowband, we added broadband. And, and on the third devices side, you see in the middle, we have added unified vehicle and, and wearable. And a unified vehicle basically is a device that uh, switches automatically between broadband and narrowband, depends on, could be a different criteria. It could be a geo, geo, uh, geofencing, could be based on reception, cellular reception. Let's say you lose you lose the broadband uh, signal, uh, the, um, the radio will switch automatically to narrowband and vice versa, seamlessly to, uh, to the end user. And the wearable is another technology that we have just launched uh, last week. Um, it's a device, it's an LTE device that a police officer, ambulance, or whoever would be able to communicate uh, over cellular with with broadband. So those two technologies now are connected together via a cloud platform that we have added into the mix and we have just introduced to the market. So you see at the top there is a Tate Cloud platform and we are in the process of adding on top of the push to talk over cellular, we are adding mission critical push to talk, we are adding mission critical data, we are adding mission critical video among other applications that we'll bring into the mix as we move forward with the technology. So this is on the network side. On the devices side, aside from the unified vehicle and the wearables that you see in the middle, we are to add, um, or to introduce to the market non-LMR unified devices for vehicle, non-LMR portables. When I said non-LMR, which means broadband devices uh, that would support any any frequencies, not only in New Zealand, uh, those devices are going into Australia, there are different bands in Australia, uh, into um, uh, the UK and, and uh, Europe, North America, of course, with Verizon, AT&T and FirstNet, and also for, uh, for Latin America. So those, those devices will support uh, frequencies 
uh, for all um, carriers around the world. And we would add also a, a third party smartphones into the mix to augment the entire, uh, our entire portfolio. So that would take us to the next uh, decade or two until um, let's say New Zealand police, for example, will get trust on broadband and would uh, abandon the, uh, the narrow banding technology. So this is um, just on the, on the wearable, uh, the device that I've uh, just mentioned that we've introduced uh, uh, last week and will go into a full production uh, coming uh, January of next year. I put this up to, as an illustration of how we are moving forward. And all over the world, in critical communications, governments are encouraging the provision of cellular network coverage for police, fire, ambulance, and other uh, emergency services. Once the network infrastructure is in place, the thinking is that everyone will move to, to that. And over time, mobile radio will fade away from, uh, from the picture. The general uh, direction is seen in, in our technology roadmap too. I can share with you that this year, I, uh, in, our, in terms of R&D, uh, unlike the previous year, uh, this year 50% of R&D our, our goes into convergence LTE broadband and 50% would still in, in, in our bending. Uh, as we move forward, probably 70% will go into broadband and 30% to, uh, uh, to, to uh, narrowband. Uh, but again, we would expect a narrowband to fade out from the market, not in the next decade, rather than I would say probably in the next uh, 20 years. So um, you will see those two technologies go hand in hand. And and I think, as I said, Tate is in a position well, with that product that we are just launching that is a very, very unique technology that no other have. And, and it, it is, is a, this is very, very a unique opportunity for, for Tate for the first time to compete against the, uh, the big guys. I think that there are even Motorola solutions and Harris today we take, uh, we take the, uh, Tate seriously uh, as we are introducing this product and, another, and, and the other products we have, uh, we have in, a, in a pipeline that I've just uh, showed you. Um, so with that, I think this is the, uh, the last uh, slide of my, my presentation and I'll be uh, more than happy to answer any questions if you guys have. That's absolutely fascinating, Yoram. Um, that pocket device looks quite small based on the size of the the power button yeah it's it, it is it is uh, it is a small device it is uh if you've seen the um uh, uh, the speaker mic that the police officer has today you know connected with the curly cord to to the portable it's the same size it's like it goes into your hand and and it's like it's a small device, and we just had a meeting today. We had a workshop with uh, with a few folks from from police here in our building, and they got very very excited about the device. They said that this is very very exciting, and they've asked us to have a workshop. They've asked us to have uh, uh, in one room uh, 20, uh, 20 police officers that they can they can help us uh, finalize the. Uh, the device as we move forward, and we are like, like in prototype three. And uh, but as I said, in December, we are going to finalize our design. We're going to finalize our software. So the police will have influence on that device and they would, we would be able to incorporate some of the features that they want, they want and to have uh, uh, in the early, uh, when we launch a device in early uh, 2020, 2022. So it is, uh, it is a small device. Another question, how reliable would cell network need to be uh, to get before police that uh, would trust to move to them? Yeah, so I can share with you that uh, probably you know that the NGCC and uh, Next Generation Critical Communication for New Zealand uh, and the government launched a bid uh, back in April for a nationwide 
network replacing a 20 year old network with a new uh, with advanced technology. We're talking hundreds of, hundreds of millions. We're talking over a 900, 900 million dollars that the government is um, is putting towards a, a new system for for New Zealand. For New Zealand, it goes to of course police, New Zealand police, St John, Wellington ambulance, and uh, also uh, the fire, New Zealand fire. And uh, so initially, they said that. They would like to have a convert solution, uh, project P25 LMR, because they trust LMR for 20 years and they don't want to deviate from that. I told you that customers are very reluctant from moving to cellular because cellular is not yet is not there yet. There is no preemption, no quality of service. It's it's a commercial system. It's not for public safety. But at the same time, they thought about having also mission critical, adding adding broadband into it. And as we submitted a bid and with other competitors back in April, uh, back in June, I would say we submitted a bid. Then they called us back and the other competitors back and they said, you know what? The broadband technology, the cellular technology is not there yet. So we would like to postpone mission critical push to talk over cellular for even 2027 and to enhance our, um, our P25 or the, the narrow, uh, narrow bending system between now and 2027. And that's the reason they're not 100% sure that when a police officer will press the button, you know, using a cellular network in a duress situation, that you, he, he would be hurt. So, they don't want to take the risk, and therefore they are relying more on narrow bending rather than on uh, in cellular. So you would see, and you know, New Zealand police now are thinking maybe 2027 they would introduce cellular. But again, they are not going to leave the narrow bending for the next 10 or 15 years. They're going to still rely on narrow bending. And just one more question before we go into the breakout rooms. Uh, obviously, COVID had a massive effect on many businesses across the globe over the last 18 months. How did the COVID-related supply chain issues affect Tate? Very, very good question, Andy. Very good question. Uh, we suffer as everyone else. Uh, supply chain is a major issue, and it started with the components, with the semiconductor industry, right? Um, we are using, I'll give you an example, we're using Intel, Intel chips and in, in, across of the entire product portfolio. And Intel, um, we usually, uh, we used to get uh, supplies from Intel, uh, lead, uh, was, uh, lead time was about 24 weeks. Uh, six months ago, they extended it to 40 weeks, then 50 weeks, now they're talking 80 weeks. Wow. 80 weeks lead time and 80 weeks lead time got us to a point with where we had to go and redesign our entire portfolio and we are redesigning the product as we speak on the fly because we cannot plan you know for 80 weeks uh, customers we we're getting orders and we have to we have to ship product and and we we don't we're not getting chips so we are going through a major, major redesign as, as we speak. And, and the good news, as I said, everything is in one roof at Tate. And that's why we, uh, we are fast to react. And um, usually, you know, if we go back to Marola and Harris, a redesign of a product with a new chip would take them, would take them at least eight months. Here at Tate, I can tell you we're doing it in three months. In three months, it's, it's incredible. So. We are in a major, major redesign of our product to meet, uh, to keep us going uh, just because of those uh, supply chain issues. And so Alex has asked the question, where are you getting chips from instead of Intel? I'm assuming you're moving across to another chip manufacturer or an alternate chip? Uh, we, uh, yes, we are moving, we're moving to a different, uh, I, I mean, we are, I don't want to say that we are banning Intel completely yeah. rather than rather than having another supplier. So if we get Intel chips, we would have two SKUs, I would say, in the factory. We get Intel, we produce a product, you know, with the Intel chip. 
we get the other other manufacturer, we, we would have another SKU to um, and, and use the other chip. So that's what we're doing. We kind of a hybrid uh, situation to um, not to have all eggs in one basket. So if one suppliers would say we don't have chips with you for you, we'd have another another supplier that would would be able to accommodate us. So that's 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 what we're doing. That's why how we're accommodating it uh, to to make sure that we don't get to a point where we can supply products to our customers. Crazy times. Well, well done. Uh, fantastic to hear how much you've been doing over the last 50 years and all the best for the next 50. It looks like you've got a good roadmap there and exciting times ahead, I'm sure. Good to see Tate continuing to be the influencer it is here in Christchurch's tech community. So uh, thank you very much for that, Yoram. And uh, you're sticking around for some questions in the breakout rooms as well.